Hey SpongeBob, have you ever played a Monster Hunter game? Would you like me to rank all the games? Alright then. So, you may not know this, but when Monster Hunter Rise got released, on March 26, a company in Japan gave all of its employees the day off just because so many of them were wanting to take the day off to play Monster Hunter Rise. And now, March 26 for that company is an official holiday, known as Monster Hunter Rise Launch Day, which is pretty cool. I mean, imagine 10 years from now, March 26, 2031, an employee comes into work and the boss is like, what are you doing here? It's a holiday today, go home. And the employee goes, oh, but what holiday? What do you mean what holiday? It's Monster Hunter Rise launch day. Isn't that amazing? This game will never be forgotten, at least in that specific workplace. And you know what else is amazing? Me ranking all the Monster Hunter games. So let's start doing that. But I do want to mention that I won't be including these spin-off games. Or in other words, the ones that don't feel like a Monster Hunter game. Like Monster Hunter Stories, Riders, and so on. Okay, so at the very bottom of the list, number 18 is Monster Hunter, released all the way back in 2004. The first game in the series and the one that started the whole franchise. Theoretically, this game is the worst when compared to the other ones, with just 6 weapon types, poor controls and only 14 large monsters, the majority of which aren't very exciting. But as I've said, it is the first game in the series, so despite all the flaws, I see it as an excellent idea and a great foundation for the future games to build upon. Number 17, Monster Hunter G, released in 2005. This Japan exclusive game is an expansion to the original Monster Hunter. And boy did it expand. It added monster subspecies, size differences, G-rank quests, higher sharpness levels, and more. Unfortunately, due to the fact that overseas Monster Hunter wasn't very popular, this title never made it outside of Japan. But this brings me to the next game on the list. Number 16, Monster Hunter Freedom, released in 2005. It's basically a PSP port of Monster Hunter G with a few enhancements, and thankfully it did release overseas. It rebalanced some weapons and the actual game to make it more solo friendly, added the ability to upgrade low rank weapons into high rank weapons, added guild cards and a couple of other nice touches. While all this sounds fine and dandy, some other things weren't so fine and dandy. For instance, you could not play online, which doesn't make much sense since in Monster Hunter G you could play online. And don't forget that the Monster Hunter Freedom is based on that game. Also, fun fact, while I was reading reviews of this game, I came upon this one specific review and well, just check this out. Cons, can't switch equipment during missions. What the heck? I've heard people say Monster Hunter is too repetitive, that it doesn't do a good job of helping new players understand certain mechanics, but this, this is just new astrophic. That's a word that I just came up with and it's basically new plus catastrophic combined. Good job Games Radar Plus, you just made me come up with a new word. Number 15, Monster Hunter 2, released in 2006. This was a sequel to the first game. We got new weapon classes, the longsword, gun lance, hunting horn and bow, a new village, a new town, day, night and season system, new monsters including some of my favorites like Yamatsukami and the White Vitalis, the addition of decorations and decoration slots and many other new features, ultimately making it much better than the original. Sadly, this game, just like Monster Hunter G, did not release outside of Japan. Number 14, Monster Hunter Freedom 2, released in 2007. So remember when I said that Monster Hunter G was a Japan exclusive game, but that was okay because a year later it got ported overseas to the PSP as Monster Hunter Freedom with a few enhancements? Well, something similar happened with Monster Hunter Freedom 2. It got released in the other parts of the world and it was kind of a port of Monster Hunter 2 as it included a lot of the features that were added in that game as well as some new content of its own like minor adjustments to the locations. Yet not everything was ported over such as the season system and the elder dragon Yamatsukami. Alright, so in MH Freedom, we were not able to play online, but surely that has changed in MH Freedom too, right? Surely I'll be able to play with my friends over the internet this time, right? Yeah, no, no, they still didn't add that. But this was the first game released in the West in which players could access DLC content, so at least we got that. Okay, I'm dying of curiosity to see what Games Radar Plus has to say this time. Any egg retrieval quest? Okay, I agree. Getting used to the controls? Mm, yeah. Being leashed to a power outlet. Oh boy, are they really blaming the PSP's battery on this game? 
That's just steered. It's a word I just invented, and it's basically stupid plus weird combined. Number 13, Monster Hunter Tri, released in 2009. Capcom made a couple of questionable decisions with this game. First of all, they removed some weapon classes that were in previous Monster Hunter games, and more specifically, the bow, gun lance, hunting horn, and dual blades. They barely brought back any previous monsters, with Rathian, Rathlos, and Diablos being the only returning ones, and also, there are no returning areas. All of these things are unfortunate, but thankfully, Monster Hunter Tri also got a bunch of new additions. The Switch Axe was introduced, which is one of my favorite weapon classes. We got completely new areas, some of which include the new feature, known as Underwater Environments, which allowed underwater combat. Now I know a lot of people didn't like this, but I personally found it to be pretty enjoyable, and because of it we got some really cool new monsters, like Gobel and Lagiacris. This game's graphics were also very very nice, and much better when compared to the Monster Hunter games that came before it. Number 12, Monster Hunter Online, released in 2013. This is an MMO not fully developed by Capcom, and it only got released in China. However, it wasn't region locked, and it was free, so theoretically anyone was able to play it. One thing that you've most likely immediately noticed, just by looking at the video that I'm showing right now on the screen, is the graphics. And yeah, the graphics are amazing. I know I just said Monster Hunter Tri's graphics were pretty good, but these graphics just blow that out of the water. The game runs on Cry Engine 3, which allows for some highly detailed environments and dynamic lighting and weather effects. Its monster list has both monsters from previous games and monsters that are exclusive to this game, most of which look really cool. Seriously, look at some of these, they're outstanding. Although I'm not gonna lie, some of them have weird names. Okay, okay, we have Elemental Maristophelin, Tycoon Zamuza, Infernal Tartaronis, Kramen, Akuravashimu, Bailide. You get the idea. As for the combat, it's actually very similar to the other Monster Hunter games. In case you want to give Monster Hunter Online a try, well, you can't. Agonizingly, which is a fancy word for sadly, the servers closed down in 2019. Number 11, Monster Hunter Frontier, the first version of which released in 2007. This is an MMORPG and, agonizingly, the servers closed down for it as well. It was only available for play in Taiwan, Japan, and Korea. One thing that I've always thought was really cool about this game is the fact that ever since it was released, it kept getting new updates and more and more content, like Minecraft. And by the time the servers shut down, the game had over 12 years worth of content. Therefore, it is filled with different monsters, armor sets, weapons, and other stuff. Now, Monster Hunter Frontier is the game that is most different from a traditional Monster Hunter game. The skill system is different, and the battles feel similar to an actual Monster Hunter battle, but there are definitely things that set it apart. For example, in some quests, there could be up to 100 people fighting the same monster. Just like with Monster Hunter Online, this game has some really cool exclusive monsters. However, unlike Monster Hunter Online, this game wasn't free. There is a 1 month free trial, and after that you have to pay around $10 per month, which in my opinion is way too expensive. A basic Netflix subscription fee is cheaper. Originally, I was going to put this game a lot lower on the list, but because of the sheer amount of content that it has, I think it deserves the number 11 spot. Oh, and I almost forgot. Higanjima, the fish-faced humanoid titan monster, also known as the worst monster in the series, is exclusive to this game. I've made a video about it, if you want you can check it out, it's absolutely disgusting. Not the video, the monster. Number 10, Monster Hunter Portable 3rd, released in 2010. This is yet another game that was only released in one specific region, that being Japan. Furthermore, almost everything in the game screams Japan. The way the houses look, the armor set that you start out with, the way the NPCs are dressed, all clearly have a Japanese theme. Kind of like another Monster Hunter game that was released recently. Compared to the games that were released before it, Monster Hunter Portable 3rd's combat is much better. Besides the fact that all weapon classes have been fleshed out, the developers also greatly improved the monster's hitboxes, which did wonders to enhance the overall gameplay. The only gripe that I have with this game is that it doesn't have a G rank, but that didn't stop Famitsu readers from voting this game Game of the Year 10 years ago. Good job Monster Hunter Portable 3rd, that's a pretty nice achievement. Number 9, Monster Hunter Freedom Unite, released in 2008. 
This is the definitive Monster Hunter game on PSP, and it's basically Monster Hunter Freedom 2, but with a bunch of new content. We got new monsters such as Nargakuga, Hypnocatrice, King Shakalaka, and... Uh... Queen Vespoid? Alright, so just like with Higunjima, the world would have been a better place if Queen Vespoid had not existed. Not only is its design kind of dull, but it also only has like two attacks, making the battle extremely boring. Besides the monsters, we also got new areas, first generation maps, over 200 new quests, new weapons such as G rank weapons, a new sharpness level, and many other new additions, making it the biggest game of the series for its time. Oh, and you can finally play online in this one. GamesRadar Plus probably realized that their Monster Hunter reviews suck and decided to not write a review for Monster Hunter Portable 3rd, but they made a comeback with Monster Hunter Freedom Unite. So let's see what they have to say. Pretty much all MMO style grinding. Wait, I don't understand. Every Monster Hunter game up to this point had grinding, and you never complained. And now you're putting that as one of the game's flaws? Also, are you saying that all MMO games that have grinding are bad? So World of Warcraft and the RuneScape aren't good games? Oh man, it's not the grinding that's bad, it's it's you GamesRadar Plus. Number 8, Monster Hunter 4, released in 2013. Now before you go in the comments and say, this is Gaijin Hunter's favorite Monster Hunter game, how could you put it so low on the list? This is unacceptable. Let me explain. This isn't Monster Hunter 4 Ultimate, this is simply just Monster Hunter 4, which released before 4 Ultimate and also only released in Japan and South Korea. This one was great. We got not one, but two new weapon classes, the Insect Glaive and Charge Blade. Some really cool new monsters, including two of my all-time favorites, Gormigala and Talamador. And for the first time ever, we got an actual story. As we progressed through it, we got access to new villages. Honestly, it was really great seeing Capcom put more effort into the storyline. They also put more effort into platforming. So now in some maps, to get to certain locations, we had to jump from rock to rock, or jump off a cliff, which you actually had to do quite often. And for the first time ever, this is where they introduced mounting. You jump on a monster and start stabbing it like crazy. It was awesome. Number 7, Monster Hunter 3 Ultimate, released in 2011. This is a huge expansion to Monster Hunter Tri. Obviously, we got a bunch of new monsters, the most notable being Brachidios, which also added the blast element, and the Dire Morales. G rank was added, pretty much all weapon classes from previous games were added, and other things. But there is one feature that was added, and the person that came up with the idea not only deserves a raise and a chocolate chip cookie, but also an autograph from SpongeBob himself. This feature is the target cam, and its purpose is to immediately redirect the camera towards the monster when you press the L button. This is extremely helpful, especially for those that play Monster Hunter on a gaming system with only one joystick like the PSP and 3DS. And speaking of the 3DS, you can't play Monster Hunter 3 Ultimate online on this system, but you can on the Wii U version. This is very perplexing, as the 3DS is clearly capable of having online play. Number 6, Monster Hunter Generations, released in 2015. This game was a tribute to the whole series. It contained a lot of updated fan favorite monsters and areas, as well as monsters and areas of its own, such as the Faded Four, Glavinus, Astalos, Gamut, and Mizutsune. The thing that separated this game from all of the ones that came before it are the arts and styles. There are two groups of people, the ones that liked arts and styles, and the ones that disliked them. I am part of the third group of people. The ones that absolutely love them, which is why this game, as well as Generations Ultimate, which I'll talk about soon, are so high on this list. So what are arts and styles? Well, arts are anime like big dramatic moves that you can utilize. They can be an attack, a counterattack, a way to heal yourself, and so on. Styles drastically changed the way you approach and attack a monster, as they altered the hunter's moveset and gave them access to different hunter arts. There were four styles and they each had their own gimmick. For example, aerial style allowed you to jump on monsters and propel yourself into the air, while adept style allowed you to evade a monster's attack at the last second and perform a deadly counterattack. So yeah, I really like these. Moreover, for the first time ever, you can now play as a palico, which is basically like a new weapon class. This game also introduced deviants, which are kind of like subspecies. They're monsters that have survived extreme conditions and they now look different and behave differently. 
I really like these as well. They look cool and their weapons and armor sets are really good. But crafting them and fully upgrading them does take a while. Which isn't necessarily a bad thing since this game doesn't have a G rank. So hunting these deviants is a nice end game activity. Alright we are finally down to the last 5 games. If you've made it this far, here's an imaginary Spongebob toy, just for you. Number 5, Monster Hunter World, released in 2018. What can I really say about this game that hasn't already been said before? Capcom really outdid themselves this time. The graphics are absolutely stunning, and the actual world feels so new and beautiful. There are no more loading screens between areas, and exploring the vast environments gives you a sense of excitement, like you're on some great adventure. The monsters now don't look like they're just waiting for you to come and attack, they interact with the environment and with each other. If you don't attack and just watch them, it truly feels like you're watching an actual monster in its real habitat, and this makes the whole world feel more alive. There are just so many quality of life improvements. With that being said, there are some things that stop this game from being perfect. For example, the weapon designs weren't very unique and diverse. There were only 31 large monsters, the game stopped at G rank, and the endgame wasn't very good. Number 4, Monster Hunter 4 Ultimate, released in 2014. This was the one that really got me into the series, and from what I've seen, a lot of people consider it to be the best classic Monster Hunter game. It's an expansion to Monster Hunter 4, and by this point, I'm sure you know what that means. G rank was added, a new town, new weapons, armor sets, new moves for some weapons, an increased maximum leveling guild quests, some other things, and 20 new monsters, including the frightening tar covered Gogmazios. Oh, and I haven't talked about guild quests. These are what the end game consists of quests that are randomly generated when completing expeditions and that have a specific level. If you want, you can save it to complete it multiple times. This will level up the guild quests. At level 140, the quest will be much more difficult than G rank content, but it will have a chance of dropping relic armor and weapons. These are RNG created and they can be extremely good, way better than any G rank equipment, which is why guild quests are the main end game activity for most players. By the way, the monsters at level 140 are really strong. I mean, most can cart you in one or two hits, which is crazy. Number 3, Monster Hunter Rise, released in 2021. This game is really really good. It's basically classic Monster Hunter plus Monster Hunter World, which is what fans have been asking for. No loading screens between areas, endemic life, turf wars, all make a return here. Not only that, but we also got some new things. Doggos make an appearance, whereas previously we only had Catsies, arguably the best combat in the series, killing monsters has never felt better. Magnamalo is a thing now, and some other new monsters. But just look at Magnamalo, he's so cool. And the wyvern riding is also really cool. I still can't believe it exists. I mean, we can ride monsters now? What? Are you serious? Instant 10 out of 10, right up there with this animated series called Spongebob. But in all seriousness, this game does feel like it's missing some things. For starters, it's relatively easy, and there's not much of an endgame. Currently, at the time that I'm making this video, only version 2.0 has been released, and while it did add some much needed elder dragons and some harder quests, it definitely still isn't enough. But we have lots of things to look forward to. Event quests and collaboration quests, version 3.0 is right on the horizon, and possibly other versions. Some sort of G rank or master rank expansion is also most likely to happen at some point in the future. So this game, despite being really good already, will be even better. And when that happens, it may move up a spot or two on this list. Number 2, Monster Hunter Generations Ultimate, released in 2018. This is the Monster Hunter game that I've played the most. Remember when I said that Generations doesn't have G rank? Well, this is the same game as Generations, but with G rank and so much more. 93 large monsters, 27 maps, 17 deviants, 6 hunting styles, a wide variety of hunter arts, and over 1500 different weapons. This is probably the Monster Hunter game with the most content, and it definitely is worthy of that word ultimate in its title. As I've said, the hunter arts and styles made the combat so much cooler and more entertaining for me. You know how when you switch the weapon type that you're using, the combat starts to feel completely different? Well, styles have the same effect, so if you constantly mix up weapons and styles, you're guaranteed to never get bored. Or at least that's what happened for me. But in the unlikely case that you do get bored, 
Well, you can try Prowler mode, which plays completely different from a Hunter. Oh man, I enjoy this game so much, and I actually still play it from time to time. In fact, I still have a checklist of things that I want to do in it. Alright, the question that you've been asking yourself throughout the whole video is finally going to get an answer. Oh, I wonder which game he'll put on the number one spot. Ladies and gentlemen, give it up for Monster Hunter Diary Poka Poka Ayuru Village DX. eBay gave this game a 5 out of 5, so it must be good, right? Look at all of these cute cats that it has. Wait, what's that? You think I'm giving the number one spot to this game? Oh no no, I haven't even played this. But if you have played it, let me know in the comments if it's any good. I was thinking of trying it out ever since I found out that an English patch exists. Number 1. Monster Hunter World Iceborne, released in 2019. The original Monster Hunter World was incredible, but it does have its flaws. However, if we take the game, add the new content, and fix the flaws that it had, you get a masterpiece. That's almost exactly what Iceborne does. It adds a whopping 40 large monsters, a new story, and a master rank which the original really needed. Not only are the master rank quests challenging, but they also give you access to master rank equipment. The end game this time around is more enjoyable, as before it basically consisted of you hunting the same 4 elder dragons. Unfortunately, a lot of weapon designs are still pretty bad, but overall, this game so far is the best, in my opinion. Now, I'm gonna need your ultimate attention on something that I just cannot understand. Monster Hunter World, 9 out of 10 on Steam. Monster Hunter World Iceborne, 6 out of 10 on Steam. Dear Monster Hunter community, Please explain this to me. Game X Nations is the best channel in the world.